Brilliant, good to be with you uh, all this morning. Let's, uh... If you want to turn back in your Bibles to Mark chapter 7, that's on page 1010. We're going to be looking at both our Bible readings. Brilliant. <laughs> Thank you, Glenn, for, for reading for us and um, for regularly serving us in that way. That's great. So I'm going to begin with a question. Nice one. In fact, let me just pray and ask for God's help. Let's pray. Father God, thanks uh, for your word to us. Thank you that you are a good God, full of love your people and thank you that you speak to us through your word. Father, the words that we read in Mark 7 today are really challenging, so please um, soften our hearts and understand what you have to say to us today, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so what is it that calls the shots in your life? What, what is it that carries most authority? When push comes to shove, what helps you draw the lines about what's right and what's wrong? Pete, there's no point pointing to your wife. <laughs> I can see everything here. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, yeah, uh, fun aside, as Christians, as God's people, it should be God's word which directs and drives us with all of our decisions. If the Bible does that, it doesn't mean that life is always going to be easy. Because God's word says some really challenging things. Now, uh, here on the picture, you may spot a slightly younger Ruth, but the person on the left of Ruth is a girl called Sarah. This is a picture taken from the Gambia back in 2003. Sarah was a girl from a Muslim family who became a Christian, who put her trust in the Lord Jesus, who took the Bible as her number one authority. That meant that she was kicked out of her family home, she was disowned by her parents, she couldn't go back home, and now her only family was the church. And uh, she, she became a Christian through the Gambian Christian uh, student movement, and we uh, met her on that trip to the Gambia all the way back in 2003. For her, following the Bible was really costly, because it is what Jesus says is costly. Now, for all of us in our lives, oh, oh, it should be a blank one now, I'll just leave that picture there for a minute. For all of us in our lives, we have non-negotiables that we base our life upon. For example, stealing is wrong. And as Christians, it says that in the Bible, stealing is wrong, right? If we decide to disregard what the Bible says about certain parts of life, then who are we to say which parts to pay attention to? Because the whole of its authority would be undermined. So you either need to take it all, or you, you kind of lose it, okay? So, if we disregard, uh, so, so hang on, let me, yeah, let me explain. So, for example, if I said, yes, I trust Jesus as my Lord and Saviour, and I want to obey him, but I'm not gonna pay my taxes, and actually, I'm going to do what I can to wiggle out of paying other bills. And I'm going to fraudulently make a benefits claim. And I'm going to use my friend's subscription for Netflix. And I'm going to use one of those dodgy box things you can connect to your telly to watch the Premier League. Lots of other things, right? Basically, I'd be saying what Jesus says about money doesn't matter. I'd be saying that that part of the Bible could just be ignored, right? And if you saw that, you'd think, hold on, that doesn't make sense. What they're saying they believe doesn't match their lives. I'd given up on following God's words. You'd be right to question it. Now, thankfully, the Church of England is built on the authority of the Scriptures, the Bible. And uh, some of you will have heard me talk about the 39 articles in the past. These are kind of like the foundation documents that the Church is built on. Article 6 says this. Holy Scripture contains all things necessary for salvation. Consequently, whatever is not read in Scripture, nor can be proved from Scripture, cannot be demanded from any person to believe in as an article of the faith, nor is any th such thing to be thought necessary or required for salvation. Okay? 
By Holy Scripture is meant those canonical books of the Old and New Testaments whose authority have never been doubted within the Church. That's basically the 39 books of the Old Testament and the 27 of the New. Now, this is not the case for the whole of um, a, a, around the world. For example, the Roman Catholic Church is different on this. For Roman Catholics, they say the words of the Pope carry as much weight, if not more, than the Bible claiming that the Pope is infallible. And they say, in Vatican II, which is one of their kind of founding documents, they say this, it's not from sacred scripture alone that the church draws her certainty about everything that's been revealed. Both sacred tradition and sacred scripture are to be accepted and venerated with this same sense of devotion and reverence. So that's one of the big differences between the Catholic Church and the Anglican Church how you kind of weigh what the Bible says and tradition. Now, why are we talking about all of this today? Well, it's really important because uh, in Mark's Gospel, yet we did start this series way back in 2019 when I first arrived, and many of you are new here since then. It's great to have you with us. Some of the sermons are back on our website, but don't worry. As James said, there's a little overview in our new sheet and we can pick up from chapter seven, it's fine. But today we're gonna to see how Jesus teaches us that tradition can completely undermine the word of God, rendering it useless. Right? Tradition can render God's word useless. It's a really big deal. And this fits with some of the things you might have heard come out from the Church of England this week. So, um, I'm more of a geographer than a history person, right? but we're gonna have a quick history lesson. All right, are you ready for this? Here we go. Uh, as I've already showed you, the Church of England is built on the Bible, right? The problem is that that's not always been enforced. And so there was a guy called Richard Hooker about 400 years ago, who wanted to describe a kind of middle way between the Church of England and the Roman Catholic Church. And he said that the church should be built on three things. Scripture, tradition, and reason. So kind of what you think. And so uh, often it's been described as like a three-legged stool, like three kind of uh, platforms you can build the church on. Joe, if you just flick that um, screen on there, you'll be able to see what's on there. Oh, right, oh, maybe, maybe the power's come out from the back then. But anyway, um, yeah, he was saying that you can only really interpret the Bible in light of tradition and reason. Um, today, that kind of works out like, yeah, tradition's important, but actually reason, or you could maybe change reason for the word experience, they're really the trump card. So in the Church of England at the moment, you have kind of scripture in third place, then you have tradition, and then you have reason. So the, the three-legged stool looks a bit like that. I really had to use some good computer skills to do that. <laughs> right. So I hope you appreciate it, all right? <sighs> yes. Now, we're gonna see how this kind of approach to church and life is a real big problem because of what Jesus says in Mark chapter seven. All right, so there's a bit of a link and that's the end of the history lesson, okay? If you love history, I could point you with some other things to read, I'm sure. So let me give you a few key facts about Mark's Gospel. Our series in Mark's Gospel is all about meeting the king. Mark was written by... Mark. Yes, well done. He was also known as John Mark, if that's interested. Um, he was really helped by Peter, one of Jesus' closest disciples, okay? You see, uh, most likely the earliest gospel written, so in the AD 60s, so about 30 years after Jesus died, easily within the lifetime of eyewitnesses. It's not just history. In any of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, it's not just history, it's God's view of history. That's what we get in Mark's Gospel. We read in Mark chapter one, verse one, that Mark is all about good news about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It's good news in Mark's Gospel. And it's got the simplest structure out of all the Gospels. It's in two halves. The halfway mark is kind of chapter eight, when Peter says that he recognizes Jesus as the Messiah. The first half shows us Jesus' power. The second half shows us how Jesus uses his power, not to crush people, but in servanthood. It's totally amazing. 
And we get two questions as we read Mark's Gospel. Who is Jesus and why did he come? That's a whistle-stop tour of Mark's Gospel. There's more info in the, uh, in the new sheet. So, today's passage, Mark chapter 7. Uh, we're going to see how tradition can kind of undermine or nullify God's word. But let me just say, tradition isn't all bad, okay? It's not all bad. On Friday, we had a traditional funeral service for dear Robin. And that was a great help to us as we followed that pattern of, uh, of how, to, how to do the service and those familiar words and all sorts of things. Tradition can be a help to us, okay? So it's not all bad. I'm not trying to throw the baby out with the bathwater. But we need to see that tradition can nullify God's word. Nullify means to kind of make no use of or no value of or even to cancel out. So in other words, tradition can give the cancel culture treatment to the Bible. Uh, Now, it would be worth flicking through the first six chapters of Mark's Gospel, even if you just look at the the, the headings over the next week. But in chapter six, just before chapter seven, we see um, see the cost of following Jesus, because John the Baptist is beheaded. We see who Jesus is as redeemer, as he feeds the 5,000 on all the links that that brings to the Old Testament. And we see Jesus walking on water. So have a look, Mark chapter seven, verse one. There's always crowds in Mark's gospel. This time the crowds are the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And we need to remember in Mark chapter three, it's the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who say that Jesus is from the devil. That's how he drives out spirits, the evil spirits, because he's from the devil. They are not fans of the Lord Jesus. And so in verse two, Uh, Some of the teachers, uh, the teachers and the Pharisees of law say this, they saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. Eating food with dirty hands. This is difficult for me as a primary school teacher. (laughs) Right, it's lunchtime, go and wash your hands. No, actually wash them with water. Yeah, we, I've been there, we've said those kind of things, okay? Eating food with unclean hands sounds disgusting, doesn't it? And the issue of whether something or someone was clean or unclean was a massive issue for the Jews. And it tells us why, actually, in our passage. Have a look at verse 3. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they came from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, and they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So there's a huge contrast here, okay? At the end of chapter 6, we hear about Jesus healing the sick in the marketplace. So just flip back one page to chapter 6, verse 56, okay? It says this. Uh, Wherever he went, into villages, towns, or countryside, they placed those who were ill in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. Now, this is really important, okay? um, Sydney, just relax. I'm going to come and touch you, okay? Jesus, in the marketplaces, would come and would touch those who were ill or diseased, and would bring healing to them. That is a huge contrast, I'm dropping everything this morning, a huge contrast to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Because they wouldn't touch anybody who was diseased because they would be like, if I touch you, I'm gonna be contaminated by your uncleanness. So in verse three, uh, back in chapter seven, we're told they give themselves to ceremonial washing. Oh, come on. <laughs> Ed, would you just go to that? There we go. They give themselves to ceremonial washing. But this is so different. It's not like they're using Carex to kill 99% of all germs. It's just ceremonial. It was a tradition thing. And what we need to remember is that while it was true that the Old Testament did call for various washings from defilement, they were only prescribed for the priests. Not 
for everybody. That's because the priests were acting as kind of like a mediator between the people and God. So they needed to be clean. But the Pharisees, no. They've added on all these rules and traditions going beyond what the scripture says. And that's why they could accuse Jesus' followers of eating with unclean hands, even though they weren't priests. Which leads, next one please Ed, just one one, leads the Pharisees and the teachers of the law to ask their stinging question in verse 5. They say, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders, instead of eating their food with unclean hands? Why didn't Jesus' disciples follow those extra rules? Why don't they follow all the traditions? Well, at this, of course, Jesus is very apologetic. And he says, oh yes, how silly of me. I really should have insisted that the disciples wash their hands properly. Is that what he says? No, it's not what he says at all, is it? Jesus answers them back really strongly with a warning about the danger of man-made religion. And so he says in verse 6, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. Jesus quotes uh, directly from Isaiah 29. And he calls the Pharisees and the teachers of the law hypocrites. He's straight in there with it. In Jesus' day, a hypocrite was an actor. Someone pretending to be something they're not. But God knows. Of he knows our hearts. We can't hide anything from him. And in the rest of chapter 7, Jesus goes on to explain further what this means. But there's a mismatch between outside and inside. Their hearts were far from God. Verse 7 tells us that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they worship in vain. They're not following God's rules. They're following rules made by man. Man made religion. And so verse 8, Jesus says, you've let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. Um, I often quote from J.C. Ryle when I'm looking at Mark's Gospel because he's given some really helpful insights on it. If we just click to the next one, Ed, thank you. Uh, Bishop J.C. Ryle was a bishop in the 1800s and he says this about this passage in Mark 7. He says, Let the history of the Jewish church be a warning to us never to trifle with false doctrine. He's got a great way with words, hasn't he? <laughs> he says, if, what, if we once tolerate it, we never know how far it may go or into what degraded state of religion we may fall in the end. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law had allowed so many extra rules and traditions that their hearts had gone far from the Lord. And we need to guard against the same. Now, we don't have time to go into it today, but in verses 9 to 13, I might give you a bit more information on this next week, we get another example from the Lord Jesus about how this works out. Basically, the Israelites, right, they were to care for their mothers and fathers. It's in the Ten Commandments, isn't it? To honour your father and mother. But they were getting out of caring for their mums and dads by man-made rules. By saying they were giving money to the temple. And if they used a certain form of words, which included Corban, which I don't fully understand, if they do that, then that can never be retracted according to these uh, rules and traditions. So that money that they'd given to the temple or that they gave to the temple kind of stopped them caring for their mums and their dads. It was outrageous. They were taking a good thing, giving money to the temple, and using it for bad reasons, to excuse them of any obligations they had to care for their parents. Uh, I'm happy to explain a bit more of that over coffee, if you want. But it's, it's a terrible example of them using tradition to nullify God's word, to, to see God's word as, as, as not important. It tells us that in verse 13. Now, as we draw things to a close, just uh, next one, Ed, if we may, uh, I've got two applications for us here, two challenges us for us to think through. Firstly, Church of England-wise, and secondly, personally. So firstly, Church of England, right? Uh, not only do we have that three-legged stool, as I've shown you, we've got a really wonky stool in the Church of England. And that's been shown particularly by developments this week. I don't know if you know anything about this, but if you don't, I'm going to fill you in. If you do, it won't be a surprise to you. In short, all the bishops of the Church of England have got together this week 
and have decided three things. Um, and as I share these things with you, um, just let me say, it doesn't bring me joy to be uh, talking about some of these things again from the front. But they are a presenting issue for us at the moment that we need to be clear and loving on. So the bishops have decided, number one, not to change the Church of England's doctrine that marriage is between one man and one woman for life. That's a good thing, because that's what the Bible says. Okay? They've also written an apology to LGBTQI plus people apologising for the mistreatment many have faced over the years. That also is a good thing because many people have been mistreated and that is wrong. What's not clear in the apology is what exactly the Church of England is apologising for. You could read the apology as if the Church of England are apologising for their doctrine of marriage. So that's a slight unclear thing. The third thing is that the Church of England have decided to write, share and produce prayers to bless same-sex couples' relationships and same-sex civil marriages. In short, it's a really confusing mess. Because the bishops are saying on one hand that they're not changing the doctrine of marriage, that it's between one man and one woman for life, and on the other hand, are proposing prayers of thanksgiving and blessing for things which go against the doctrine they're saying they're affirming. To further add to the mess, the Archbishop of Canterbury won't use those prayers himself for the sake of unity for the whole Anglican Church, yet is happy to endorse them and produce them, but the Archbishop of York will use them. So you've got on one hand, the bishops are saying that the doctrine isn't changing, and on the other, they're producing prayers and resources that actually show in effect that the doctrine has changed. Really, it's a real mess that helps nobody. It doesn't help LGBTQI plus people. It doesn't help us as churches. The reason they've gone down this line after six years of the living in love and faith process, which you may uh, have heard us speak about in the past. Uh, the reason they've gone down this road is from, uh, to quote 1 John chapter 4, they say that God is love. Therefore, in short, we should bless all loving relationships. Now, this isn't the time to go into why this is so damaging, and this isn't the time to go into how God's plan for marriage between one man and one woman for life is good for everyone, whether you're single, whether you're married, whether you're gay, whether you're straight. This isn't the time for us to remind each other that we must be welcoming and loving to all, while still holding to what the Bible says. But friends, I wouldn't be doing my job, and I wouldn't be being faithful to my ordination vows if I didn't believe, uh, if I didn't tell you and encourage you to believe that what the Bible says is true and right and is good for us. What the Bible says is good, is good. What the Bible says is unwise, unhelpful and wrong, even if our culture says something different, is unwise, unhelpful and wrong. We mustn't use modern tradition or reason or experience to nullify God's word. And to kind of show how unsustainable this new situation is, it would be like the bishop saying this, we won't change the doctrine of the Trinity. God is still Father, Son and Holy Spirit. But we've produced this whole suite of prayers for you to pray to a fourth person of the Trinity. It's that kind of thing. It would make no sense. Uh, there's much more to discuss on this. But we mustn't lose confidence in God's word. We mustn't lose confidence that God's word is good news for everyone, whatever their gender, whatever their sexuality. And we must be loving towards everyone and remember that we are fully in need of God's grace. We're not perfect, we're not holier than thou, we're not more squeaky clean or anything. And we must get on with the task of telling people the good news of the gospel. 
And so while we have to think about these things, we're going to unashamedly keep doing that in this benefice. And please hold me to account if we ever lose our focus on that. Uh, to find out more, one of the things I dropped is just, uh, there's a, an article here uh, responding to the bishop's proposals for same-sex blessings. Uh, I emailed it round yesterday in our church family update, but there's some hard copies in the leaflet rack at the back there. Um, please do take um, and read these. Uh, but also, let's think personally, okay? I, I just say these things aren't easy. Um, I've got... Uh, um, uh, friends who are same-sex attracted, I've had colleagues who are same-sex attracted, and I've got people in my family who are in um, uh, same-sex marriages, if you like. So these things aren't easy. But let's just think personally for a second as well, because we started off, didn't we, with the question, is God's word able to shape your life? What traditions or habits do you have that perhaps you're unwilling for God to shape by his word? And is it, there's a kind of easy test to find out whether the Bible is your supreme authority or not. And it's this. Simply, do you let... Oh, I think you can click to this, actually, Ed. Thanks. Do you let the Bible change you? Have you changed your mind on something or your behaviour after reading the Bible? And could you come up with a recent example I think that helps bring home the challenge of Mark 7 to us personally. It might not be anything radical, like a big change, but it might be just a little reminder of something that you've become comfortable with that's actually not helpful. So could you think, just for a moment, about this question, just personally? So I'm going to leave that on the screen just for a moment for us to think, and then uh, in a moment I'll, I'll lead us in a prayer and hand back to James. Father God, please help us to be open, to be led by your spirit so that we can be changed by your word. Father, so that we can become more like Jesus day by day. Father, please keep us from a, from a pride and an unhelpful kind of superior attitude, Lord. Keep us from that. Help us to be humble before you, confident in you, and willing to serve you, whatever the cost. Just like that girl Sarah from the Gambia all those years ago. We ask this Lord in Jesus' name. Amen.